Welcome to Not Just a Transaction, the podcast series hosted by experienced real estate authorities, Nick Prefontaine and Zachary Beach. Each week, the hosts bring you expert guests to help you navigate the many creative options available for buying or selling a home while cutting out the costly hurdles of a conventional real estate deal. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Not Just a Transaction. I'm your host, Nick Prefontaine, and I'm I'm actually really fortunate. I'm really blessed to uh, be joined by Paul Moore. Uh, Paul, after a stint at the Ford Motor Company, Paul co-founded a staffing firm where he was finalist for Michigan Entrepreneur of the Year two years straight. After selling that firm to a publicly traded company, Paul began investing in real estate, founded multiple investment and development companies, appeared on HDTV, and eventually completed 85-plus real estate investments and exits, including a large multifamily development. He has contributed on Fox Business and is a regular contributor to Bigger Pockets, producing live video and blog content regularly. Paul has co hosted a wealth building podcast called How to Lose Money, interestingly enough. And he's, he's been a featured guest on 200 plus podcasts. Paul is the author of The Perfect Investment create enduring wealth from the historic shift to multifamily housing and storing up profits. Capitalize, I'm not done yet, capitalize on America's obsession with stuff by investing in self-storage. Paul is the founder and managing partner of Wellings Capital, a real estate private equity firm. So Paul, welcome to the show, not just a transaction. We're happy to have you. And I'm glad to be here, but I'm exhausted listening to that bio. You know, I, I, I was a, um, I used to think of myself as a serial entrepreneur and I think that was a big mistake, but anyway, hopefully we'll get into that on the show. I, I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that can ever be a mistake uh, to be candid with you, Paul, that that's, a, that's a good thing and a good thing for everyone to hear. Now, uh, like, like we like to start out all of our shows. I know I read the bio and I, I gave the introduction and everything, but why don't you tell the listeners kind of who you are? What, Absolutely. Who's behind the man, the myth, the legend, Paul Moore. Hey man. Well, I don't know about that, but, uh, I know that, uh, I grew up not knowing any entrepreneurs and except the uh, local pharmacist that I stole something from when my dad was in there getting, I, I actually went back after I graduated from college, like 10 or 12 years later and said, man, here's $3 for, I don't want to say on air what I stole, but it was something that I had no business thinking about as a seventh grade male. Maybe you can guess. Uh, I, yeah, I can gather it. Okay. So the same thing they sell in machines and bathrooms. So anyway, I don't know why I did that. But at any rate, I paid him back $3 plus a dollar interest after college, and he was shocked. But anyway, why am I saying this? I, I, I thought a dollar would be good for 10 years, you know? <laughs> but at any rate, um, I didn't know any other entrepreneurs. And I went to, uh, I got an engineering degree, which was my next mistake. And then I got an MBA, which was not a mistake. And in the MBA program, they had an optional class that was called uh, entrepreneurship. And it was a, only two people out of 120 in my class took this optional class. But I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool to be an entrepreneur? Well, I went on to Ford Motor Company. And the whole time I was there, I mean, from the first month I was at Ford, I was trying to tinker, thinking about what to do on the side. And finally, after a couple of years, I thought, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. Even though I like my job, I like Ford, I still drive a Ford. Uh, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. And um, so I started looking seriously at entrepreneurial options. And about five years in, I quit and started a staffing firm with a buddy like you said earlier. And um, I went from that to lots and lots of different 
uh, businesses. And I, and I really enjoyed the ramp up period, the startup period. I got revved up. I was talking to my business coach earlier and saying, you know, I get really charged up starting something new. I wonder what it would like to be, be like to not be in the middle of starting something new. That would be kind of a weird feeling for me. But he said, well, what if you're supposed to just be at rest and peace and take an extra day off or two a week instead of always charging so hard? Well, I hadn't thought about that before all those years. And honestly, I'll tell you, I, I think I got such a charge out of being productive that I wasn't really that productive. I was like busy. And I found out something really interesting, Nick. Did you know that most, I, I shouldn't say most, but many of the billionaires of the world started out with one clear vision in mind as a teenager, and they stuck with that. They said no to thousands of distractions, and they said yes to the one thing, and they do really well. Like Bill Gates, he decided to be in computers as a teen. He's never wavered from that. Uh, Warren Buffett started at, what, age eight investing, and he never wavered from that. And I think I would have been better off if I would have only known in my teens or 20s about the power of real estate to create wealth. I think I never would have wavered from specifically, in my case, commercial real estate. So that's who I am, a, a serial entrepreneur that has repented and become a focused fund manager. I have repented. That, that's funny. Uh, something that came to mind, and you you can probably clarify for uh, for myself and the listeners, is that for when you said the word when you were at Ford and you started tinkering, I was thinking, well, Ford probably doesn't appreciate that you're tinkering with their their process and their their assembly line and everything like that. But that was you know me just being a jokester that's oh all. no i get it you know and there was a guy at ford i gotta tell you this i've never shared this on a podcast there was a guy there that there was this place where all the overstock stuff like the old ford emblems was one thing for sure but all kinds of overstock stuff from eight warehouses around the country was a 2.1 million dollar warehouse i worked in and they called it the crc the central return center where everything got returned he just couldn't stand it. He ran that place for years and years, maybe decades. He couldn't stand to see some of the stuff thrown away. So he took it in at home in his lunchbox. Well, finally, Ford got wise to this. And he said, oh, yeah, 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 I do that. And they said, well, wait a minute, you take stuff home that you're supposed to put in the garbage? And he's like, yeah, yeah, come on. And he showed him his garage and it was full of Ford stuff he had collected. He wasn't even selling it. He was just collecting it. That guy got in big trouble for tinkering. <laughs> well, I feel honored. That's a, um, that's a podcast first and so not just a transaction exclusive. Yes, that's uh, right, Nick. Story. No one else has heard that. So we, we should all feel blessed. I haven't even that. told my wife that story. I don't think. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Now, Paul, how did, how did you, how did you transition out of working at Ford Motor Company? Now I get the, I get the firm that you started and everything, but how, how was that process going into it? Like, how did you transition from that? Absolutely foolishly. I was 29 years old and my wife was seven months pregnant. I had a great salary I had this great job at Ford. I was on the management development track, which I didn't want to be on. I get all that. But check this out. I had, after 11 months of plowing in this business, I was 3% of the way toward getting enough clients to quit Ford. I don't know if that makes sense. In other words, I was 3% of the way to my 12-month goal in 11 months. In month 12, I got one client that more than made up the other 97%. And I quit Ford with my wife, seven months pregnant, you know, with health insurance. Of course, I had Cobra and all that health insurance wise, but I quit. And this one client, I was counting on them to pay me like 97% of our money from one client. And as I think about it now, I don't know if I would do that again at 57 years old. You know, it's been about 30 years ago since that happened. I don't know if I would do that again, but it turned out amazing. I will say that a year later, that client stopped paying me. They were very, very unstable. 
But by that one year, in that one year, I had enough clients to replace them. It was amazing. What a great year. Wow. Sounds like it. Well, congratulations on, um, on that. That working out for sure. Now, um, Paul, the second, the second question that we'd like to ask all our listeners is what it is you do now. What is your day to day now? Nick, a lot of people in single family residential or other types of real estate, they, they see commercial real estate as an avenue for wealth generation and in passive income, cash flow, et cetera, but they have no idea how to get there. They've heard about the tax benefits. They've heard about people like our former president who paid $750 a year in taxes, and they know they want to get into commercial, but they don't know how or who to trust. Our company, Wellings Capital, provides an on-ramp for people who want to invest in commercial real estate passively, but they don't know who to start, who to trust, where to start. We provide them an on-ramp. We have diversified funds that combine self-storage, mobile home parks, and potentially other asset types into a fund that allow investors to invest once with us, let's say $50,000. And that's spread across dozens and dozens of assets. We have different operators, different geographies. We just have a lot of diversification in there. And uh, our goal is to provide cash flow and appreciation and tax benefits for our investors. Wow. So it's more, it's more just a kind of a almost, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like a hands-off approach to real estate investing where you don't have to deal with leaky toilets and uh, like maintenance problems and that kind of thing. It's a little is bit that, like what you accurate? do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's less involved in the day-to-day -day than you guys are, but it is basically passing the, uh, the um, responsibility for toilets, tenants, and trash to the experts, just like you do to the mm -hmm. buyers of your houses. And we pass that over to the experts. We let them manage all the hassles and we just get a paycheck in the mail, uh, you know, an investment return every month. And then we spread that out to hundreds of our investors. You pass along to your investors. Wow, that, that's fascinating. Now, if there, Paul, if there was one thing that the listeners could gain from this, if, they, if they're interested in learning more about what you do, where would you direct them to if there was one thing they could do? Uh, you know what? I, for years, like I said before, I didn't know how to get involved in commercial real estate. I was doing single family flips. I was doing lease options, lease option sandwiches, uh, wraparound mortgages, uh, flipping, um, doing flipping waterfront lots, building homes. And I found out something, Nick, you shouldn't build a home if you don't know how to tighten the doorknob in your own home. I just think that the audience should know that. But anyway, seriously, um, I was trying to figure out how to get involved in commercial real estate and I didn't know how. So recently I created a guide for people who want to on-ramp into commercial real estate. And it's a free e-course and they can get that by going to my website. It's Wellings capital.com that's w-e-l-l-i-n-g-s capital.com slash resources and uh, that free e-course also comes along with uh, guides to getting involved in self-storage investing mobile home park investing and also my book on getting involved in multifamily investing well you just breezed over that my book yeah so you, yeah that that's pretty awesome um, I think the that information that you shared will be able to be in the show notes. So, you know, if listeners weren't, if they're driving or whatever, I think they'll be able to revisit the show notes and get that information. But final, and that's great information that you're offering for everyone out there. Finally, Paul, now the most important question of the show is why is it not just a transaction to you? In other words, why do you give a shit? Man, there's at least two reasons. There's probably a dozen, but I'm going to think of two right now. First of all, these people worked really, really hard to make this money. I mean, man, when I had a W-2 job, um, I think I'm thinking about how long it took to build up enough money to invest. I just got off the phone an hour ago with a guy in Roanoke, Virginia, who's working so hard at his job and also on the side in his investments 
trying to figure out how to build up enough money to invest like $50,000 or whatever. So these people, whether they have 50,000 or 5 million to invest, they worked really hard for this. And I know, and you know, Nick, how frustrating it is to give somebody your time, your trust, your money, and then think that they don't give a crap. Like, let's say something goes wrong. Let's say something like the cash flow stops, or let's say the K-1 form, you know, the, the, the tax form is really, really late. To think that they don't care, to think that they're going home and spending their piece of the profit from you, to think that they're driving their BMW and not thinking about you is absolutely maddening. I mean, any of us who have bought a product or a service, even something off Amazon, and to think that they don't care when it breaks, like let's say you pull it out of the box and it's broken, and to not get a response, or to call a doctor's office repeatedly to ask them to, full, to refill a, subscript, a prescription and not get hold of the doctor, not get hold of the assistant, thinking, do they even care? Do they know that my blood pressure is about to skyrocket? Whatever the issue is, I don't want to be the kind of person that causes that. I want to be the kind of person, we want to have the company, Wellings Capital, that shows people that, man, we care. We really do care. And we really are putting you first. And we really do believe in the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And so we literally put people first with a goal that they would feel loved, that they'd feel cared for, that even if the investment didn't do as well as they thought, as we hoped, that they were that we're doing everything we can to help them. And we have literally this year made decisions that openly disadvantage us to advantage our investors. For example, we recently had a profit, uh, a check where we were going to split it 80-20, 80% 20, to the investors, 20 to us. We just went ahead and gave them all of it. Now, there's going to come a day when we get our 20%, but it might be years down the road. We just want to be absolutely sure that the investors feel and know that they're cared for and loved. A second reason we give a crap is that there's something out there called human trafficking. And I don't know what you've heard about it, but did you know if you took the record annual profits, not the average, the record profits of Apple, Nike, Starbucks, and General Motors, added those record profits together, tripled that number, that's the approximate annual revenues generated by human trafficking in the world. I'm telling you, it's slavery and it, it's a civil right that's been violated for tens of millions of people. And even since you and I started, since you hit record on this podcast, uh, it's estimated that almost 100 people have been sold into slavery around the world. This is a big big deal. And I'd like to believe, Nick, that if I was alive in the 1800s, I'd be an abolitionist fighting against slavery. Or if I was a, you know, an adult in the 1960s, I would be fighting against, you know, against the civil, I'd be fighting for civil rights. Well, this is a civil right, and it is slavery, and we need to get involved. And so by making a lot of money for us and for our investors, and encouraging people to invest in this, I'm hoping we can rescue, uh, you know, captives of this and stop and do our part to stop this great evil in the world. Oh wow, that's um, yeah, that's some heavy stuff, Paul. That's uh, definitely given me a lot to think about. Now that's why I'm. I had to take a minute to take a breath and think about what you said. Um, also, I hope that, I hope that that gives pause or that gives, um, at least time for listeners out there to think about the gravity of the situation and what you just mentioned, because that, that's not a small thing, uh, that you just said. Yeah, it's not. And I learned about this five years ago from an organization called Exodus Cry. And if you don't mind, I'm going to recommend that people go out and check ExodusCry.com. 
And I also recommend they do a lot of documentaries. Some of them are quite graphic. One of them that's rated PG, maybe PG-13, is called Nefarious. In other words, it's not as graphic as some of the others. Uh, Nefarious, N-E-F-A-R-I-O-U-S, uh, is a fabulous documentary, and we highly recommend that people watch it to learn about this great evil and give you some ideas on how you can get involved. Wow. Well, wow. You just, um, <laughs> you, you, you just, uh, sidetracked my day. You, you made me, made me think that's, uh, that's definitely a worthy cause. And I think it's something that everyone should, um, consider getting involved in for sure. Thank you for sharing that Paul. And thank you for being on the show. Yeah. Uh, not just a transaction. And if anyone, as I mentioned previously, if anyone was interested in learning more, about Wellings Capital. Um, we will have all the links in the show notes. And um, once again, on behalf of the listeners here, thank you for joining the show today. Man, it was really an honor. I really appreciate what you and your brother-in-law and your father have done here. And uh, I'm always in such admiration of all you guys. So thank you for the honor of being on your show. Thanks, Paul. Have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to another episode of Not Just a Transaction. If you want to learn more on selling a home, buying a home, or resources to learn more, head on over to our website at originalre.com.